<laughs> Again, hi everybody. My name is Marianne. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Marianne. <laughs> and I have done the work as it's laid out in the book with the help of a big book step study sponsor, a God of my understanding, uh, many meetings like this and just many meetings in general throughout the fellowship. I've finished all my formal amends and practiced 10, 11, and 12 on a daily basis. Ah, more about alcoholism. Uh, Gosh, I had so many thoughts coming uh, all this week. And I, I really, you know, when you're home alone and you're uh, going through this stuff, you sound great, you know. <laughs> I, thought, I thought, you know, Mary, you could like really do a show in uh, Las Vegas with all this material, you know. But uh, the reality of it is, is that I do have uh, social anxiety. So when I'm up here, all of that is gone totally gone. Uh, but I do have a God of my understanding, so I did pray myself here, that's for sure. So under uh, more about alcoholism, I have the ism underlined, and I have ism means I serve me, and that's pretty much it when I'm uh, active. I'm really only paying attention to myself. Okay. Uh, I'm going to share a little bit about that first sentence. Most of us have been unwilling to admit we were real alcoholics. That was a stumbler for me, the real alcoholic thing. Um, because according to the dictionary, uh, which means uh, something like agreeing with known facts, real, honest to be, genuine, I am a real alcoholic. But I chose to use the definition of a real alcoholic that's in the book on page 21, mostly because that didn't apply to me. <laughs> I had a few toenails over the definition, but not much. I had, I could read this definition and just say, oh, and not identify with it a lot. And so to me, that, that makes me a potential alcoholic. And of course, not having done the work yet, and not having looked up words, in my mind, potential meant maybe, possibly, you could be. Okay. I know different today, thank God, from doing the work. But that was a reservation for me that I didn't know I had until I did the work. I didn't know that I didn't really even though I'm going to A meetings, even though I'm not drinking, even though I'm saying I'm an alcoholic, somewhere subtly in the back of my mind, I wasn't a real alcoholic, so it might be okay to drink if the occasion arose. And I probably would get away with it for a little while at least. So uh, thank God for uh, sponsorship because we read these pages very slowly. In fact, too slowly for me. <laughs> uh, people that I had come with were already writing and we're still reading and I'm like what is wrong with her you know <laughs> at any rate I was able to see that uh, even though I called myself a potential alcoholic and I probably fit the definition for potential alcoholic that on where is that page on page 39 it says but the actual or real or potential, me, alcoholic, with hardly any exception, will be absolutely unable to stop drinking on the basis of self-knowledge. This point we wish to emphasize and re-emphasize to smash home upon our alcoholic readers that it has been revealed to us out of better experience. So the bottom line is I can't drink in safety no matter what kind of an alcoholic I call myself. And that was good to know because it saved me probably years of excruciating pain if I had picked up again. I have no idea what that would be. It was bad enough to get me here, and according to what we've read today, it's not gonna get any better. So, to me, this chapter is the second part of step one, and it tells me why, even though I can truly believe that I'm an alcoholic and I can't drink in safety because I have an allergy to alcohol, and if I pick up, it'll create a phenomenon of craving, how come with that knowledge, that's not enough? That's not enough. I have people that I've known over time that are allergic to strawberries. Another person was allergic to peanuts. 
and they had found that way, uh, found that out because of some kind of allergic reaction they had. And believe me, I could, uh, they wouldn't take a strawberry or a peanut if their life, de and their life does depend on it, but I mean, they wouldn't. They just wouldn't. They check all the ingredients and they do all this kind of stuff. So how come me, knowing that alcohol is just the same, how come I'm not picking? How come I can't not pick up? And this, is, this part is why he's telling me what it's not, because it's just not the physical part, it's the mental part. And this part is in introducing me to what the insanity of alcoholism, the part that tells me no matter what, uh, this time will be different, one won't be a problem, uh, I can have one, not that I ever had wanted one, I never wanted one, I wanted three. I always wanted just three because I knew after three I could go possibly into a blackout. So I always went out with just three in mind, Marianne, no more than three. Not ever knowing that that was too many. I was on my way. I don't know if I ever just had three. I can't remember. So anyway. Uh, so I wrote down, this is things I do. <laughs> I wrote down all the ways that they talk about this insanity. And here's a whole bunch, they call it the strange mental blank spot, the foolish idea, the serious mental twist, the curious mental phenomena, the strangely insane, peculiar mental twist, subtle insanity, that state of mind, this sort of thinking, mental inconsistencies, queer mental condition, plain insanity. I don't think I need any more definitions than that. So, uh, the good news is, is there's a solution for this. And, and, and surprisingly so, that comes before I even get to this chapter. It's introducing me, it's like I'm in a sandwich here. I've got the solution uh, chapter in, before this that tells me what the solution is. And then after I read this, I have more about the solution. And I don't think that's uh, by circumstances her that that's in there. That they start with the solution, they tell me more about alcoholism, and then they end with the solution. Um, because they're talking to someone who's not mentally well. I had a hard time with understanding that. I, was, uh, I worked in uh, my professional job was working with... Uh, in the psychiatry field. So I saw mental illness at a level that uh, I didn't identify with. So I didn't really think I was insane at all. But it was clear after a while of going to meetings that I was insane about picking up a drink. And uh, I have many stories to, to show that. I don't want to bore everybody with that. I'm sure we all have our stories. Um, what I want to talk about a, a, a few more minutes, though, uh, before I end, is that even though I have a solution how to deal with the uh, problem of alcohol, the physical and the emotional, even though I have a spiritual solution, which will, if I work it, uh, will put me into remission, it doesn't cure me. It doesn't cure me. And I have to accept the fact that even though I'm not drinking, I still have that peculiar mental twist in my brain. And I have to deal with that on a daily basis. Okay. And by the time I get through to 12 and come back to 1 again, I know that it's not only about alcoholism, it's about everything. And that's my diseases in my head. And so it's going to use anything that I could possibly think of or think of doing to get me back to drinking. Mm -hmm. That's its job. It's a disease, and a <laughs> disease's job is to make me sick and kill me. That's its job. And it's, mine is very good at it. <laughs> so... On a daily basis, I have to work this program just the way it's laid out. I don't have to worry about adding anything. I don't have to shift it and change it. I don't have to 
do anything. It's already laid out. It works perfectly fine. It worked for people that were much sicker than me uh, with their alcohol use. And, but I do have to own it. I do have to make it mine. I do have to make these steps a way of life for me. So I'll just give you some examples. I have an example from the other day, which was good, but when I drove here today, <laughs> oh my God, I thought, you don't have to go back a couple days. How about right now? <laughs> Honest to God, I had planned to come here in time to help set up with a box of cookies. <laughs> that was my plan. And I looked at the clock, and oh my God, I'm going to be late if I don't get dressed and get out of here. So I got dressed okay. And of course, I'm driving them on the other side of the city. And of course, there's some festivals downtown, so I can't go my regular way. I have to go another way, which I know, but I'm not familiar with it. So everybody in Worcester was trying to keep me from getting here on time today. <laughs> People were stopping and letting people cross the street. People were stopping for lights. People were going slow, so they're not going to make the light. I couldn't believe it. They had a road race, and they were running along the side of the road, but I had to watch out so I didn't hit them. And, you know, I couldn't drive here as fast as I wanted to. Oh, I prayed here all, just slow down, slow down, slow down, drive safe, drive safe, drive safe. I got here 20 minutes early. Honest to God, total, that's insanity. That's how my brain works. So I'll just tell you this story though. Anyway, do I have time? Yeah, okay. go right ahead. All right, so, so I'm watching my sodium because the doctor wants to pay attention. Well, he wants to pay attention to my blood pressure. I'm perfectly fine with it, but <laughs> he doesn't think so. so. So I'm sitting down to lunch and my wife says, I thought you were watching your sodium. And I know she's talking about the little, the little pile of Fritos I put on <laughs> to my sandwich, which wasn't a sandwich. It was just a roll-up because I was being so good. <laughs> so immediately I can feel the weight of the six-packs on my hip. You know, not the six-pack, the six guns. Six guns. Yeah. Six guns, I guess it's called. Yeah. Six shooter guns, yes. And I can feel the grenade strapped across my chest. And I can hear the hordes of the army coming from behind me that I'm rallying to my side, right? Because how in my head I'm hearing, she's such a control freak. <laughs> What's in any of her business? She's always micromanaging me. What's the problem? You know? That's what's going on with me sitting there. <laughs> That's the insanity of my disease. How come I don't think, oh my gosh, she loves me so much and cares about me so much. Look at how she's paying attention to me. Thank you for loving me. You know, does that ever, does that, you know how that did come to my mind? 24 hours later, two, <laughs> two tenth steps and a twelve, an eleven step. That's what it took to, for me to come to that place from the place I was at. Thank God I've learned in this program when I feel that rush come up where I'm getting ready to, you know, detonate, <laughs> that I keep my mouth closed. Mm -hmm. Shut my mouth. I learned that here. Just shut your mouth and breathe, Marianne, okay? Keep, keep those lips together because thank God I'm not a ventriloquist because when my lips are together, I, <laughs> I cannot talk. I can't talk with my lips together. So that's good news for me, okay? Yeah. And I've learned to turn the, front, you know, the lips upside down and just kind of smile. So I just did that. I just clamped my mouth and went. <laughs> <laughs> and that was good. That was good. Because I was, didn't know then that I was going to need 24 hours to come to the place where I was able to appreciate, not detonate her. <laughs> and so, uh, so that goes, and now that's, that's not like early sobriety for me thinking, uh, you know. I mean, I could get away with it if I was in early sobriety. I'd give myself an excuse, you know. That's not that, and that's not before I did the work. That's now with some time under my belt and having done the work. That's how this works because you know where the roots are that, of that are? My, the roots of that are, if you had a wife like mine, you'd drink too. That's where that's coming from. 
that's where that's coming from. And if I don't pay attention to that and catch that and change, I will be out uh, picking up. And I don't want to do that today. I really don't want to do that. In, in here somewhere, I, I, I marked it and now I, I have so many marks I don't know which one it was. But anyway, it says that, oh, it was the guy at the end. Even though uh, everything's not, you know, peaches and cream, it's so much better. I don't want to change this. I wouldn't change this for my best day drinking, they say in here. And now I know what that means. And uh, I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I mean, you know, when they made pot legal, I mean, if you would have told me when I was active that their pot was going to be legal, I don't know if I would have walked in the doors here, okay? But at any rate, I would have never thought I could stay sober through that. I never thought I could stay sober. I would never thought I could say to people, you know what, I'd love to come to your party, but I know people are going to be smoking there, and I don't want to put myself in that situation, okay? And feel good about that. Not feel like I'm a victim or I'm deprived or poor me. I don't have to do all that. I feel good about that. I feel like I don't want to jeopardize a moment of my life today with alcohol or drugs. I don't want to. It's just, it's not even anything I would want to have. And that's a miracle. That's, I mean, there's miracles every day. But that, I wouldn't be willing to give up my sobriety for anything is a miracle beyond belief for me. It's just like, who are you? You know, but anyway, thank you for listening and I'm. Um... <laughs>